Welcome, welcome. Come on in, we're gonna start shortly. few more people in. everyone we're gonna get started so make yourselves comfortable i want to make sure you can see me yes looks like you can see me all right so hello everyone thank you for joining us today welcome to the final made a career conversations of this specific series uh today's title today's session uh as you know is titled 15 minutes versus forever long-term brand building in a short-term world featuring storyteller Mark Miller, which I'm very excited to um, chat with today. Uh, my name is Zeynep Gular tuck I will be hosting today's conversation. Um, I'm very excited about today's conversation um, as brand building is something I know a little bit about, uh, but more on that later, I'll intro myself. Uh, before that, this is a virtual event, as you know, and since we're not gathered in the same space, I recognize the following land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. If this is the case, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. The website you can go to to reference um, uh, is native-land.ca and we've just put it in the chat. So that's a good resource that you can check in on. As a member of York University of the York University community, I recognize many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tuckeranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. The Mid-Career Conversation series was created with alumni like yourself and myself in mind for alumni to connect, to hear each other's stories and experiences of other alumni, ask questions, and really share your own journeys and ambitions. Um, today will be a special opportunity for us to come together as York alumni to share our stories and experiences. Um, it's something that I love doing. I'm a storyteller by, by trade and by craft, but also at heart. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm also a fellow York alum like yourselves. I received my BA a million years ago in 2002. It feels so long ago, um, but I'm proud to be volunteering my time to be today's host. Uh, for the past 20 years, I have um, made storytelling really the compass for my career um, and the focus for my career since I've worked across the media, PR, 
tech and nonprofit sectors. Um, during that time, I've produced content that, um, for example, the web series, commercial broadcasts, and newsworthy editorial for global audiences with collaborators like Microsoft News, Lonely Planet, Time Out, NBC, Course Entertainment, and the like. Uh, when I started working in the tech sector, um, in the last decade or so, I began steering my career into career to into more purpose and cause driven work. Um, the content I've created has garnered over a million dollars uh, for girls in STEM, uh, for racial justice, for COVID-19 relief, and for climate action. Um, and the production studio I founded amplifies the voices of entrepreneurs with disabilities, women in tech, um, as well as those in my community who have suffered uh, devastating losses uh, as a result of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria recently. So um, the, the type of, I'm very passionate about the work that I do. Um, and I know our today's storyteller is as well. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about how today's gonna go down. So you know what to expect from our chat. Um, our storyteller will de deliver a 20 minute talk and then afterwards, we're going to take questions from you. And as always, we ask that obviously your comments be relevant and respectful. Uh, feel free to choose the choose the chat if you'd like to, or you can raise your hand. Um, after the Q and A, we'll stop recording and we'll move into kind of the breakout rooms and the networking session of our uh, of of our conversation today. So for about 10 minutes, you'll be able to get some networking done. You'll be able to meet fellow alum and fellow uh, people who are in their mid-career. Um, and then we'll return to the main room for final remarks. You are encouraged to have your video on, please, if you can. I know it's really tough these days um, to have lots going on, but if you can have your video on, it'll make us feel like we're in the same room just for a little while, but it is entirely optional. Uh, as per Zoom meeting etiquette, we ask that you stay on mute until the Q&A. Um, if you have not done so, you can click the mute button um, by your screen. Also, if you'd like, um, you can also change your, you can rename your screen name. Mine, for example, says Zainab Gularatak, my name, my pronouns, and then my BA02. So if you want to do that, that's a great networking tool as well. And you can click the rename um, the button in your uh, in your screen on your Zoom menu. Now, without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome our storyteller for today, Mark Miller. Mark is a York alumnus, keynote speaker, author, and chief strategy officer at Team One in LA and Los Angeles. Um, so it's kind of early for Mark, so we really appreciate that he's uh, he's on now. Uh, Mark's thought leadership has been recognized in North America by many of the most significant honors in marketing and advertising, such as the Advertising Research Foundation David Ogilvy Awards for Research Excellence, the J. Shiat Awards for Strategic Excellence, and the Effie Awards for Marketing Effectiveness. Welcome, Mark. Nice to see you. Thanks good for joining morning. us. For me, and good afternoon for everyone there. Thank yes. you for, uh, for including me. Take it away. All right, so I'm going to do my best to uh, screen share. And so hopefully, hopefully my screen is in fact being shared. Um, if someone could confirm that, I will get going. You can see my screen okay? Yeah, we see it. All right, so I'm going to just uh, go for it. So um, here we are. Uh, Mid-April 2023, um, another one of those years seemingly of uh, volatility, um, economic uncertainty, political uncertainty, uh, health and wellness concerns and realities persist. And somehow in this uncertain, less predictable, uh, somewhat volatile world, uh, we're all asked to either think about making decisions about our own lives, our own careers, and or if we're working inside of organizations, um, how we're helping to contribute to those companies or lead those companies uh, forward, which is a very challenging thing to do when it's hard to imagine what's next or right around the corner. Um, and yet, informed uh, by research, um, I'd like to share a point of view on that. And like all good presentations, I think I'd like to begin with a story. And this is a story about uh, my daughter. 
So the young lady you're seeing on the screen, uh, that is my daughter. Her name is Haley Maya Miller. And she was about to turn six years old. And my wife and I asked Haley what she wanted for her birthday. And she looked up at us with these big eyes and a big smile on her face. And she said, my whole life, I always wanted. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, she's only about to be six. What she, could she have possibly wanted her whole life? Well, as it turns out, what she wanted her whole life was this. This is a Mary Ellen doll from a place called American Girl. And for the price of the doll, the hair, the nails, and a meal at American Girl, we were able that year to make our daughter's dreams come true. As a uh, funny aside, what I want to share is that my wife asked our daughter to plan Father's Day for me that year. And my daughter said, what do you think we should do? And my wife said to her, well, why don't you think about what your dad really loves and we'll do something related to that. And she said, oh, we should take dad to his favorite place. We should go to American Girl. And I just want to let everyone here know that this is not my most favorite place in the world. But nonetheless, it made me think that at certain points in my life, and probably the same for each of you, we've had that moment where there are things we've always wanted. And so when I was my daughter's age, the thing that I always wanted was a fuzzy bear doll because I used to watch a show called The Muppets. I remember writing The Muppets. They wrote me back. It meant everything to me. And when I was uh, 10, the other thing I always wanted was a Maple Leaf shirt. So um, I am originally from Toronto. I used to go to the games with my dad. They were not a very good team when I was growing up. Uh, but the shirt was symbolic for the time that I spent with my dad and the experiences we had together. And that was very meaningful to me. And when I was a little bit older, the thing I always wanted was a VHS copy of uh, the movie Star Wars. And um, here's the most important piece. Not only did I know what I wanted, but just like my daughter, I knew where to get those things. So I could get the doll at a place like Toys R Us, and I could get the shirt at a place like Sears, and I could get the film at a place like blockbuster and that's just the way it was until it wasn't um not too long ago uh a little bit before uh, the pandemic the covid pandemic um there was an, a pandemic of a different kind and that was the disappearance um, or vulnerabilities of companies that we thought would probably be there for a long time so toys r us went into bankruptcy and actually disappeared uh, from the united states uh, for a little while sears went into bankruptcy and blockbuster disappeared except for a single store and we could dismiss it as um, bad luck, uh, happenstance. It's just the handful of brands that you happen to look at, but not the case. In fact, in the late 2000s, actually sort of late 2017, 18, I should be more specific, um, brands were disappearing at a faster rate than they were even during the Great Recession, which happened uh, around 2008, 9, 10. Um, again, brands were going into bankruptcy or disappearing or, or certainly becoming vulnerable. There's an interesting bit of research we did um, that we published in the book that we wrote, and that is in the 1920s, the average lifespan of a company in the S&P 500 was more like 67 years, but today the number is more like 15 years. So if you think about it in these terms, if you're an entrepreneur that's about to create a company in the world, imagine for all the time, effort and energy you put in and money the most your brand might stick around is 15 years. How would you feel about that? And on the other side of the equation, if you're working for a company that's been around much longer, a university, a college, or leading a company that's been around much longer, you have to believe you might be living on borrowed time. In response to the question, what is driving it? We found that it's not any more complex than we're living in a world that values short-termism effectively. Um, there's competition like we've never seen before. So Blockbuster never knew that there would be something called Netflix. Um, uh, brands like the Ritz-Carlton never knew there would be competitors like Airbnb. Um, there's faster innovation cycles. If you create anything, any product or service that is impactful in the world in any way, it will be copied and imitated quickly and at a lower price. People who are leading companies are in their positions for a short amount of time, it seems, more like two and three years. And as a consequence, they're making fast choices. They're thinking about building their resumes. And especially if they work for publicly held companies, they have to answer to their shareholders. Um, these are two iconic uh, business people, uh, Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett. They penned an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in the not too distant past with a headline that said the short-termism is harming the economy. And in their op-ed, they argued for thinking more long-term um, on the basis that if we did, 
the economy would benefit, worker shareholders and investors would benefit, and equally important, they talked about creating a generational legacy that we can all be proud of. Im implicitly, not just careers that we were proud of, but careers that our kids could be proud of, not just businesses that were successful for the moment, but for much longer than that, such that we could employ people for longer periods of time. Um, in the not too distant past, after doing a good amount of research, um, I've worked on publishing a book. This sounds like um, shameless self-promotion, so you, you have to forgive that for a moment. But the American Marketing Association um, gave this book an award for its sustained contribution to the discussion of marketing, that they felt that the book lived by the principles we were discussing and the thinking was very relevant for leaders trying to have a longer term sort of success. Uh, we studied many brands, uh, a lot of secondary research and a lot of primary research. Uh, 20 um, of those stories made it into the book, 20 of the primary stories. And what I want to clarify is we looked at leaders and brands that are incredibly diverse. Um, you would think that the topic of legacy would only be about brands that were like 100 years old. But what we were looking at was leaders and brands that were looking to make an impact that would last a long time. So there were younger brands, there were older brands, there were entertainment brands, there were not-for-profit brands, there were for-profit brands. Um, the Toronto Maple Leafs were in the book, so there's a Canadian brand in here too, technology brands, um, automotive brands, and so on. The foreword in the book was written uh, by a very famous uh, businessman um, named Yvonne Chouinard, who was the founder of Patagonia. And when Yvonne created Patagonia, the important thing to know is he is someone who likes to climb rocks and or mountains. And his point of view was he wanted to be able to climb those things without causing harm to them so that the ones who followed in his footsteps could also climb and enjoy. He, he talks about creating a world where we can move through it without leaving a trace so the next generation can enjoy it like the current generation. He so believes in his values and protecting land, including parkland, that in and around 2017, when the, um, uh, the US leadership um, had policies that were less in favor of protecting parklands, that Yvonne posted this message right on the homepage of his retail website. So if you thought you were going to buy a jacket before you ever got to buying a jacket, you were confronted with a message that said the president stole your land and they talked about the importance of protecting parklands. And there'd be plenty of people who would say, why would a leader or brand ever do that? Why would you ever go out of your way to lead with your values if it meant that you might alienate 50% of your audience? And his perspective is he was speaking to 100% of the people who cared like he did. And he wasn't worried about alienating 50%. What he wanted to do was motivate more people to think, feel, act, and behave in service of creating a planet where we could all move through it without leaving a trace. Uh, there are five primary learnings about the leaders we discussed uh, and considered and had conversations with um, and their brands that differentiated the ones who thought long-term in a short-term world and ultimately succeeded. And these were the five principles. Um, we've all heard the expression, uh, don't take business personally, but these people do. They launch businesses and create businesses that help to solve problems that are important to them. Um, separately, we all understand that companies have slogans, taglines, messages, lovely video assets that say wonderful things, but when times go to bad, they don't behave their beliefs, and these leaders and brands always behave their beliefs. Separately, uh, it is traditional that brands think that they are in charge. Consumers are targets, literally with targets on their back. We make things, they buy things. Um, and these brands don't look at it that way. They look at their customers as stakeholders, shareholders, co-authors, co-owners of everything that they're making and building. They're not just people who want to be the best at what they do. They want to be the only ones who do it. So they invent their own game. And finally, they don't just do something interesting at one point in time. They write history and make history every day. They never stop making legacy. It's perpetual for them. The, the book is filled with stories that correspond to all those learnings. Um, I was going to share three stories today in the interest of time so there can be healthy discussion as well um, and time for networking. I'm going to focus on two. And then if I finish really, really early and anyone's interested, I'm happy to come back and do a third. So I'm going to tell a story about the Tribeca Film Festival and how that was launched um, under the heading of taking leadership personally. And then I'm going to tell a story about a young founder in Austin, Texas, uh, named Michaela Almer, who launched a business called Me and the Bees Lemonade, uh, because she collaborated closely with the people who supported her business. She let her outsiders in. I'm going to 
skip the Ritz Carlton story, not out of disinterest, but um, uh, with respect to time. So Tribeca Film Festival. Um, as I've shared more than once, I'm originally from Toronto. I grew up loving film, uh, perhaps like many of you, um, and had the um, opportunity to go to the Toronto International Film Festival. I love film. I love going to the festival. I could not understand in a world where we had TIFF and in a world that had Sundance and in a world that had the Cannes Film Festival, how something like the Tribeca Film Festival would come along and also be successful. And so when I had the chance to speak to the founders of that event festival and organization, the three featured here, De Niro, Jane Rosenthal, and Craig Hatkoff, and I said, I didn't see white space for another film festival. They said, yeah, the world didn't need another film festival. There were plenty, but Tribeca needed this one. And here's the reason why, if you never knew the story, Tribeca was a response to what happened uh, in New York in 9-11. Uh, as you know, the city was in ruins. Um, people were scared. Uh, there was a lot more at stake in terms of livelihood and vitality than just short-term commerce. But nonetheless, when everyone was afraid to come out of their homes, it's as if the city was about to shut down. And so these three founders who were from New York and loved the city, who knew something about filmmaking, who knew that New York needed a little bit of lightness in the dark and realized that you could charge people to come and see movies, put all of those ingredients together to create something called the Tribeca Film Festival. What I think was also uh, particularly interesting was they did a little experiment before they did a full-scale film festival. Um, they did something called Dinner Downtown. It, it was the same basic observation. Restaurants uh, were not thriving through this period because people were staying in. So the three co-founders used their influence and reached out to others they knew and said each week they'll pick a restaurant that they want to uh, make sure stays in business. Um, they'll invite a friend and the friend could come as long as they brought 10 other people with them. And it really took off uh, very famous and influential people from uh, Bill Clinton, the president, um, ex-president, or past president, uh, Queen Noor, and, and many others came. And so when they saw that the, the beta worked for the dining problem, they scaled it up and they created the film festival, which solved a bigger problem. So if there's a, a lesson to be learned, um, certainly when you think about businesses, uh, a company that you might work for and what they stand for, a company that you have started or may start, or even when you think about uh, your personal brand and how you move yourself through the world, um, more times than not, as you can appreciate, people begin conversations with, how do I make a billion dollars? How do I start a company and sell it? And, and then at some point they think, what might I do to earn that kind of uh, financial reward? But the companies that tend to last longer, even through the most difficult times, have a much clearer sense of the contributions they're making to culture, the world, and society before they then think about the commerce that they will do. So in this case, as I said, they were bringing some lightness out of the dark to the city of New York. They used their skill and fluency to do it, and people would pay money for it because it was important to them to participate. So it's just a fundamental shift in how we look at the world, which is, what contribution can we make before we ask for anything in return? So I'm going to skip ahead uh, to a different story about a young founder of a small lemonade brand uh, with a growing reputation in Austin, Texas. Uh, the name of the brand is Me and the Bees Lemonade. This is the young founder of the organization. Her name is Michaela Almer. I'll tell you more about her in a moment. But this story about Me and the Bees and the story about Michaela really brings to life the notion that there are plenty of companies that think the way forward is we make things, they buy things. Um, there's a divide. As I said, they are targets um, with a literal or metaphorical target on their back. We make it, we put a price on it, they buy it. And, and these are brands that just don't look at the world that way. The, the line between makers and consumers is, is effectively invisible because they make and they co-create and they co-author uh, together. Um, and so here, there's a quote from Michaela that talks about um, surrounding yourself uh, with a metaphorical hive and working collaboratively. And the story kind of goes like this. It's one of my favorites. Um, that is actually young Michaela Almer at the age of four and a half. She is at a business festival in Austin, uh, Texas. Um, so the story goes, Michaela was stung by two bees in the same week. And um, 
we've probably all had the experience that being stung is about zero fun. And particularly if you're a young kid and particularly if it happens twice in the same week. Well, her parents encouraged her to take this as a learning opportunity and they did some research and studying together. And what Michaela learned was bees actually do good for you. Um, and all of us that thanks to the bees, she gets to enjoy some of her favorite food. So Michaela and her family took a grandmother's heirloom recipe, replaced the sweetener in it with honey from bees and created a product originally called Bee Sweet Lemonade. Um, they wound up on a television show in the United States called Shark Tank, which I imagine you're familiar with. And I know you have the Canadian equivalent of it. I think Dragon's Den. And she wound up with a $60,000 investment from one of the sharks named Damon John. Okay. So young Michaela and her brand, Be Sweet Lemonade, wound up in Whole Foods Market, invited to Good Morning America, invited to the White House by the Obamas. And very quickly gets a letter from a farmer in California uh, who says, this was all fun and games when you were a young kid selling lemonade on your front lawn. But at the moment, your brand name is everywhere and my brand name is nowhere. And the problem is your brand name sounds like mine. And so I don't care how old you are. It's a business problem. And so we're going to put you out of business. You have 45 or 60 days, I think, were the terms. Uh, to give your company um, a new name, don't say anything about bees, don't do anything that um, impinges upon my trademark, and uh, there you go. And so imagine being a young child, she was about nine or 10 at this point, having built a business that you thought was, it was yours, it was your idea, and an adult was trying to take it away. The adult had the law on her side, but what Michaela had was a large group of people who believed in what she was doing, who got involved in helping her to figure out the solution. And the solution was sort of non-traditional, un unconventional. Um, if she called her brand something like bees, she would probably be breaking the trademark uh, that existed if it was a conventional name. And there were too many brands that had trademarks on something called bees anyway. So the suggestion was she had a story to tell greater than a product to sell. And so why doesn't she name her brand like the story she has to tell? And so she calls it Me and the Bees. She gets up on stage and tells people, let me tell you the story of Me and the Bees. Um, she got more distribution at Whole Foods. She wound up back in Good Morning America. She wound up back at the White House. Um, she published a best-selling book. She travels around the world teaching students about how to be an entrepreneur. And this one individual that tried to put her out of business in many ways, probably really put her into business. She explained to him, you can change my brand name, but you can't change the mission that I've always been on. Um, this is an image of Michaela being invited by uh, then President Obama to introduce him at something called the United State of Women, which was an event organized by his wife, Michelle Obama. And in his uh, conversation with Michaela, he compared her to Oprah Winfrey and Michelle Obama, which are not bad comparisons for a nine or 10 year old uh, to hear. And the lesson here then is, as you think about joining a company, building a company, growing your career, more than thinking you have to do it on your own, who are the others that you can reach out to to help you co-create, co-author, um, and build something uh, sustainable together? Um, I'm going to try and do a, a pretty quick close here so you can ask questions and or so we can get onto some networking. But um, I began this discussion by telling a little story about my daughter, and I said there was something she always wanted, and she knew where to get it. I told her things that I always wanted and I knew where to get them. And then I sort of told a half truth because I said, if those brands went away, I don't know where I'd get them. And it's a half truth because now I know exactly where I'd get those things. I didn't need Toys R Us. I could go to eBay and I don't need Sears. I could go to Amazon and I didn't need Blockbuster. I could go to Netflix. And significantly, if those brands and leaders don't pay close attention there may very well be a line through each of them sooner than you think. Um, it wasn't too long ago that I think Google felt that um, th there was not really a close competitor when it came to search, for example. But even with the past few weeks, uh, many have heard of the company called OpenAI and or of their product called ChatGPT. The world is changing. If you're defined only by the one thing that you have done in a single moment, you become vulnerable to the changes and shifts in the world. But if you have a clearer sense of why you're doing the things you're doing and where you're heading eventually, you'll actually make better, faster choices even now. So um, if there's a, a problem that I'm hoping um, to identify and sort of resolve here is 
in life as in business, um, short-termism can create some bad uh, choices and behaviors. And even though it sounds counterintuitive, I don't think the choice is long-term or short-term. I think the ones who think more long-term actually make better short-term, near, near-term choices. It's counterintuitive, but long-term thinking may actually be the best short-term strategy. I didn't have the chance to go in depth. I only talked about a couple of the principles uh, from the book about um, taking leadership personally and letting outsiders in. But the but those principles and more, behaving your beliefs, uh, don't just be the best at what you do, be the only ones who do it, and don't just do it at a moment in time, do it perpetually, are the hallmarks of leaders and brands and individuals that seem to succeed, not just for the moment, not just for 15 minutes effectively, but for a lifetime. And if I were to leave two uh, sort of hanging questions here at the end, they would be these. Um, we can either look at our lives and our careers and say, we're people who want to read from history. We'll tell the story about what we once did at one point in time, when we started our career, when we were in the middle of our career. You know, those were the best of times. Or instead, we'll be people who persist as vital and we'll be businesses that persist as vital because we don't have to change our story, but we can evolve our stories by adding to them and writing pieces of them each and every day not just living off the old stories, but adding new stories all the time. And one of the expressions that I heard from one of the leaders that we interviewed in the book that really stuck with me was they they tend to do it like this. They ask themselves when faced with a hard decision, if they made it in 10 years time, will they be happy? And what they say is, even if it is hard for the moment, they reason that if in 10 years from now, they'll wind up much happier, uh, more fulfilled, more successful, whether personally, emotionally, and or financially, um, that that guides them to making even hard choices now. That again, the long-term thinking leads to better a short-term decision-making. So I, I will pause there to say thank you. I, I went as fast as I could. I think and hope maybe I'm around 20 minutes. And, um, and I hope that was interesting to some of you, any of you, or all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. That is a lot to digest and quite a story. So I appreciate you sharing it with us. Um, I'd love to open up the floor for some questions. Please use the chat or raise your hand uh, via the Zoom button and we'll call on you to ask your question. Always, We're always hoping they'll be respectful and relevant to our storyteller's experiences and what he has shared. Um, so please take it away if you'd like to ask a question. You can throw it in the chat. Otherwise, I have a question that I'd like to ask. So I'd like to kick it off with a question. Um, I think a lot of us are wondering what's Mark, what's your advice? Really, we we just want we want the goods, right? We want the goods and the insights and the advice um, on uh, for those who really want to pursue, because you have listed what are the four qualities that we should uh, keep in mind those leadership for that leadership and to be able to build those long-term brands. But what is, what are some of the more deeper advice that you would give to someone who really wants to pursue a long-term um, ambition, but doesn't really know where to start uh, with that day-to-day -day and you say, write it each day. Um, if you can give us a little bit more and dig a little deeper into that, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. And thank you for asking. I have a, um, a really specific answer uh, to that question. And it goes like this. At one point in the process of doing some research, I'd come across a founder of a brand called Two Bit Circus, and his name is Brent Bushnell. And Brent's um, uh, father's uh, quite famous, uh, Nolan, who was the founder of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. And at one point um, in life, as Nolan was passing advice and encouragement onto his son, he had introduced something called Ikigai, uh, which is Japanese philosophy. There are whole books written on this topic. I remark upon it briefly in our book. I'll refer to it briefly right now. But Brent shared it with me as sort of common sense wisdom that his dad offered to him and co common sense wisdom that he wanted to pass forward in the world. And I, I would choose to do that here as well. Um, and you basically ask yourself four questions. They're as relatable to an individual trying to figure out where they want to go over long-term as they are to an organization trying to do the same. And the four questions go like this. Are you working on something that you love? Are you working on something that you're good at? Are you working on something that the world 
uh, needs more of such that you're working on something where you can create value out of it, whether it's earning money to sustain a not-for-profit or whether earning enough money to sustain a for-profit business. And the reason those questions matter are kind of like this, because no matter what you work on in life, personally, professionally, um, for certain, there are going to be hard moments. And if you're working on something you love, you're more likely to stick with it and work through it versus abandon something and never make it come real or never give it the chance to succeed. So the first is, are you fundamentally working on something in life uh, that you love? The second is, are you working on something that you're good at? And it matters because there are plenty of things that we love, but it doesn't mean that we're good at it or would succeed at it. And so I shared that I love film and filmmaking. Um, I think maybe as a writer, I could do okay. But as a director, I would be miserable. As a producer, I would be even more miserable. Um, so if I wanted to pursue a career in film and filmmaking, I would need to or want to find other people to partner with to help it succeed because passion alone isn't enough. Um, when, when Brent tells the story about what his father shared with him, uh, the way he talked about it was uh, sort of the old wisdom that we'd pass on um, to a younger generation to just do what you love was dangerous because if you weren't good at it, doing something you love that you weren't good at was a recipe for failure. So something you love plus something you're good at. Um, the notion that it needs to be something the world needs more of just comes down to the fact that if you're the next one doing the same thing that everyone else does, there probably isn't a lot of longevity in that. That's a race to the bottom because things that are commonly available are easily substituted, switched, and replaced. But things that are unique in the world have the opportunity to pers persist for a longer period of time. It goes to the heart of if you make a product or service, you know, try to understand what problem you're solving or service you're delivering greater than the immediate things that the world can see. Because any good product or service will be copied and imitated. You don't want to be like the rest. You want to be the only one that does what you do. And value creation and generation is important because you need to sustain um, you know, you should want to work for people who make money in a sense because they can hire more people. They can pay health care in the United States. Um, they can grow and sustain businesses. Businesses that earn money, even if they're not for profits, can hire staff and support the causes they care about. So um, it's a good thing to think about how you will create value and earn some remuneration to keep your dreams and your, your passions alive. So that was a long answer to a short question, but I think about the four elements of Ikigai, something you love, something you're good at, something the world needs more of, and how you can create value doing what you're doing. Please get the, there's an Ikigai book, but obviously we're going to also want to plug Legacy in the Making, Mark's book. And we also, if we don't have a question from the audience, I, I still have, I still have a, a stable of questions. So um, this is your chance to put your question in the chat or raise your hand right now in Zoom. Otherwise, I would love to know about what motivated you, Mark, to personally really, because you did speak about why you wrote the book and how this kind of came about, but writing is really a different beast altogether. And for aspiring authors out there, it work demands the kind of personal strength that, you know, is sometimes impossible when you have life and kids and whatever. Um, so how did you do it? But also kind of where were the origins? Where did that kind of aha moment come where you were like, the world needs this? We got to do this. Um, and yeah. I know you alluded to that, but I would love for you to expand a little bit more. Sure, I can give a little bit more insight. Um, this never started out with, um, I want to write a book and make money and how do I find the topic? I, I found much like many of the people that we studied that there was a topic of relevance and importance to me. And as it turned out, um, others felt the same way. So um, there were three realities happening all at once. Uh, the first is I, I run a reasonably large strategic planning department um, at a global agency, but our, our hub is in Los Angeles. Um, and so we have strategic planners and cultural anthropologists and data scientists. And we were doing some work for a large automotive company and a large uh, travel and hospitality company, uh, each coming up on a milestone um, that was similar. One was turning 25 and one was turning 30. The automotive brand thought 25 was too young to celebrate all their accomplishments because their competitors had been around for many more years. So they thought they weren't old enough to be taken seriously. 
um, the travel and hospitality brand saw it the exact opposite way. They thought it was better to be the brand new uh, hotel than to be the 30 year old anything. And they thought history was an impediment to their ongoing success. And so one of the early sort of sparks for curiosity was to understand the idea of history. When did it matter? When didn't it matter when it came uh, to companies and organizations? The second reality uh, was the company that I was and continue to work for, um, an ad agency called Team One as part of Publicis. Like I said, we're, we're centered in Los Angeles, but it's a global company. It was coming up on a similar milestone and was trying to understand its place and time and history, what parts of the past it would hang on to, what parts it would need to evolve. And then most personally and importantly, I was about to become a dad for the first time. And my career has always been uh, the center uh, of my life. If you had asked uh, people I dated in the past, they would tell you I was a hard person to date uh, because of the importance that work uh, played in my life. And if you ask uh, my wife, uh, she would complain about the exact same thing. And I was concerned uh, that our daughter would wonder why they didn't get to spend enough time with their dad. And um, the, the reality, of course, is uh, our young daughter deserves uh, more of my time. And that would be something that I'd mature into and grow into over time. But equally, I'd want her to understand that the things I was doing in my career were making contributions in some way. And so I just started reaching out to founders and leaders of brands that were doing things that I admired, like Yvonne Chouinard to understand how he was making a success, but also making a contribution. And very quickly we found, or I found that um, every time I reached out to people who I did not know at all, um, I admired and respected Tribe Tribeca Film Festival. I did not know the co-founders. I admired and respected the, the Wimbledon tournament in London. I did not know the, the, the re-founders, the next generation of leadership. All I did was reach out to companies that I loved and they found the topic so compelling that they reached back. Um, I, I didn't write a book initially. I wrote an article for fast company. They then asked me to write a series for them. Um, and then book publishers came and sought us out. And because we never wanted to make money in the first place, I mean, that we don't reject the idea, but that wasn't the, the driving goal here that when the book made money, we started a not-for-profit organization where on an annual basis, we give scholarships to students who are building businesses and careers that are making long, uh, long-term contributions as well. So the book is living by its values and um, it's something that I really love. It sounds like it, Mark. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are going to now move in to the networking portion of our event. So in a few moments, you'll be prompted to join a breakout room with two to three alumni. Uh, we'll have our icebreaker questions broadcast on your in your room. Um, you can choose to use them or you can kind of go your own way and you'll have about 10 minutes to connect, share your stories, and then we'll be invited back to the main room for final remarks. After the final remarks, you're welcome to stick around in the main room for uh, to chat or exchange contact information and continue the conversation. So we will have our organizers take it away.